Welcome to today's discussion in which we'll be exploring different approaches to circularity in packaging materials. Uh, global brand owners and regulators are pushing ambitious targets for universe, universally recyclable or biodegradable packaging um, in the next few years, which are in turn driving change throughout the value chain. But we're faced with different visions of what circularity could mean in terms of packaging materials and systems for uh, end of life. I'm delighted uh, today to be joined by a panel representing contrasting areas of experience and expertise to discuss how we navigate through these dilemmas. We'll be discussing recycling, biomaterials, reuse, the role of LCAs, and also different end of life approaches. And hopefully we'll have time at the end to answer some questions from the audience. Uh, please do share your questions uh, and you can do that via the YouTube chat function on this stream. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. First of all, we have Alessandra Funcia. She is head of marketing and sales at Sucano, which is uh, a world leader in master batches. Um, secondly, we have Valentin Fournel, who is head of, head of eco design at C uh, Citeo. Uh, an organization whose mission is to develop packaging and paper recycling within France. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Roberto Tangora, uh, who is R&D and quality manager at the PET recycling specialist, Dentist, Recy Dentist Recycling Italy. Hello everyone and welcome. And thanks for joining us. Hi to everyone. Um, Hi everyone. Hi. Um, so, as I mentioned, there are some radically different visions of what uh, a circular economy in, in packaged goods uh, would look like. Um, we have people who advocate um, recycling single-use plastics, uh, people who think we should be uh, pursuing more bio-based materials. Um, there are others who think that, um, that you know, single-use is inherently inferior to reuse. Um, I'd like to, first of all, think about how we navigate these these big initial choices about uh, packaging and packaging materials. Um, I don't think anyone serious is claiming there's a one size fits all solution here. Um, so how do we assess the the pros and cons of these different approaches to circularity and packaging? Um, Alessandra, could I ask you um, to give your, your initial thoughts about this. Obviously, Sukarno is kind of agnostic on this in that, uh, you know, you're uh, supplying solutions into both PET and, and biomaterials. Correct. Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone, once again. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for hosting this, um, this event and the opportunity for us to exchange and talk about uh, circular economy, a hot topic nowadays, um, long to be in the agenda. So um, at Sukarno, uh, we are a specialist master batch, or, or I like to say that we modify the polymer functionality or the polymer properties to make it fit for its purpose. So at one point, everything, at, at, to begin with, everything will come from nature at one point. And at Sukan, we understand that it is the way that we use those resources that will dictate um, the environmental impact that we will cause on those, uh, on those activities, on our activities, on the material that we put in, the, in place. We are in a situation that we um, lead the master batch uh, industry in polyester business, in packaging, besides medical, besides industrial applications in packaging itself, we do master batch for polyester. So PET is globally the most recycled uh, material in the world. Um, also in Europe, it's not different. Um, we also use and uh, promote and support biodegradable certified polyester like PLA and PBS, and we supply mass materials for that. So we understand that it's the end application and the way we formulate, the way we design those modifications that the polymer needs that will enable us and the users of the packaging from converters to brand owners to consumers, and then to give a destiny, to give a, a most appropriate end of life. And by most appropriate end of life, we are talking here, the lowest overall environmental impact. 
So we will um, navigate through um, additional recycling content, enabling recyclability, because some packagings are not recyclable, and we promote materials or master batches that uh, allow the designers to, to make a structure from multi-materials to monomaterials, for example, and several other aspects, or um, uh, the biodegradable, and I like to say certified materials that can be organically recycled, compost, home compost, and etc. And uh, for all of that, uh, we, will, we will be able to discuss later on, there is always an impact for consumers, for governments and policymakers, or from uh, them that we need to adapt and adopt. Yeah, the, the way we operate at Sukano is what we like to call the umbrella for our operations is called design for functionality, design for performance. And these are the concepts we embed when we um, put together substances to compose a master batch. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about a bio biodegradable material, for instance, it's ultimately mandatory that all the ingredients comply with the certification and continue to deliver the compostability aspects of the material to the end of its life. Thank you, Alessandra. Um, Valentin, I'd like to, uh, to ask you the, the same question about the, the pros and cons of, of different sort of visions of circularity in, in packaging materials. Um, I'm aware that CTO has, uh, has developed eco-design rules and, and you've been you know, involved in, in, in this. Oh, uh, Valentin, you seem to be muted. Yes, it's better now. <laughs> um, yes, so indeed, when we are talking about uh, environmental impact uh, of packaging, uh, we believe there are certain rules that we, we need to, to adopt uh, in order to lower uh, the impact of our, our packaging uh, on, the, on the planet. The first one, the priority should always be given to reduction. So how do we reduce the amount of material used, keeping the same functionality as needed, as at least. Um, so how do we reduce packaging? Of course, this is weight reduction, which has been done for decades now. Uh, elimination of specific packaging elements, maybe when they are not uh, specifically needed uh, for the uh, conservation of, uh, of the product. And of course, reuse. Reuse is very important, but we know that in some cases, it's maybe not the best choice and depending on the impact that we are looking at. Um, but of course, reuse uh, should be developed whenever it's, uh, it's usually when it's local um, and when it makes sense from, uh, once again, uh, an uh, ecological perspective. Then after reduction, the second uh, way to reduce the impact of packaging is to increase recyclability. So to, to be sure that they will be recycled at the end so that we do not have to reproduce a raw material all over again. Uh, so how do we increase recyclability? Usually it's going towards as much as possible a mono material, so only one material for the packaging, uh, to use a material that is recyclable. So typically in France, uh, it would be glass, uh, metal, so steel or aluminum, uh, paper or cardboard. And in plastics, we will have the uh, rigid uh, PET, PE and PP resins, and for flexibles, uh, for now it's uh, mainly PE, and we are looking into uh, developing a PP flexible recycling stream as well, but we are just starting right now. Um, and then you, you, you mentioned bio-based. Typically for us, it's, it's more looking now that that's the third um, way of lowering the uh, environmental impact. It's looking at the origin of the material. So origin of the material, of course, bio-based is one of the aspects but it's not because it's bio-based that it will be better for the environment. We have to be very careful. And when it's bio-based, we believe uh, within CTO that the best end of life for this packaging is still recyclability. So it should be recycled, even if it's bio-based. It, ca it can be bio-PET, bio-PE, for example. Um, for us, we do believe that uh, compostability or comp composting packaging uh, is more interesting uh, only for packaging that will be uh, linked with organic products, such as, for example, uh, coffee or tea pods. 
uh, or for bags to collect uh, bio waste or fruit and, and, and veggies. Uh, but it's always better to, to, to recycle the packaging because once again we do not have to, to reuse some matter to, to, to take some new materials uh, again. And of course, when we are talking about origin of the material, there is of course uh, trying to integrate as much as possible recycled materials into the packaging so that it creates also re uh, recycling streams and you lower the environmental impact of your packaging. Thank you so much, uh, Valentin. Um, so if a brand owner is watching this and, and also, you know, thinking about the, the perplexing variety of, of approaches they could take in their, their packaging strategies, um, there are the, obviously the inherent uh, properties of different packaging materials, but we also see a very uh, diverse infrastructure across uh, Europe in terms of uh, recycling availability, re recycling um, systems, uh, different preferences for different materials, etc. Um, how can this regional uh, picture of regional differences, let's say across Europe um, for a start, impact upon a brand owner's circular economy strategy and, and uh, the, the choice of materials that they might make? Um, Roberto, could I put that question to you first? Is, does this, uh, how does this impact on, on, on brand owners? Yeah, sure. First of all, thanks for the invitation, thanks team for this opportunity to share our ideas on this topic that we think is a very quite hot topic, the circular economy. Well, um, as a re representative of a PG recycle uh, available on the French, Italian and Spanish market, we can see a lot of difference uh, in uh, the quality of, our, of the packaging that we receive for recycling. So uh, in the case of, uh, of our steps, which is the, the last step of this chain, we can appreciate a very different uh, input difference uh, among the uh, bottles, uh, bottles packages, because for us it is the main uh, streams that we recycle uh, from these three different countries, but I can uh, spread and, and extend the same discussion to Europe. So um, just to re answering to your question, I think that the, the, mess, uh, the most important uh, step uh, um, I can shift on the sort collection and sorting. So this is the most important uh, the topic for us for the circular economy in the recycling vision. Uh, collect, collect well, for us, it is uh, the 50% of our work to, to make a very high quality products. Uh, a very bad collection or a, not a good sorting uh, can affect a lot on the, uh, on the quality because all it is discharge on the last step, which is the recycling. So um, for us, again, it is quite important that we are totally involved uh, in this topic because we need to press, push uh, brand owner to, for uh, an eco design because uh, it's happened to the, in the past that um, uh, design is not connected uh, always 100% to really recycling requirements. And also um, uh, with the um, uh, EPR scheme or uh, collection scheme, because we need to collect uh, well homog homogeneous streams. We had already sp uh, spoken, um, Alessandra and Valentine referred to monomaterial or multimaterial, of course. Everything that is outside PT for our case can happen, uh, can become a problem for the recycling. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we'll we'll come back to uh, talking about the the challenges around sorting um, a little bit later as well. Um, Alessandra, on the same topic uh, of the catering as as you do to you know global brand owners uh, operating across many different markets with different characteristics how does that impact on on their their strategy for circular economy and specifications for for packaging we we when we work directly our experience of working directly with the fast moving consumer goods so the fmcg companies the brand owners it shows that, that they they really have to they as much as they try to standardize their strategy, their packaging platforms, their materials, and etc. They also have to the challenge to comply to the discrepancies or the differences on each geography that goes not only beyond 
the infrastructure that already exists or the investments or the directions of that uh, this territory, this geography or this country wants to promote further for, for the end of life uh, alternatives of a given type of materials. But also there is a cultural impact for them as well. So a very common and very simple uh, example is the serving those. How big or how small should the, the material be to enable the consumer afford to, to their needs? So plastic is a material that is very democratic, very much inclusive. It allows a lot of uh, people to, to afford or have access to, to packaging or to packaged goods. Mm. But um, the technical and the economic feasibility by, will vary according to the plastic type and according to the country. And what we see is that the, consumer, the, the, the brand owners, they try as much as possible to adapt to the, con to the design of the packaging that is most appropriate to give them uh, the product uh, integrity, the brand, uh, to deliver the brand ID, and at the same time, the profile of the, the whole structure, it is recyclable like PET, it is recycled, it is collected. How is it disposed? Is it disposed with the um, um, deposit system or is it curbside? Do they have the concept of yellow bags and and end? So all these aspects frame the way, the, the, the approach of the brand owners to us. So it definitely brings us um, a lot of complexities because again, once again, the reinforce of the one side fits all, it doesn't apply. And now even more, when we have the targets of the region, we do have to be even more agile to bring to the market as much, as quick as possible, the existing technology that we already have. Recently, we saw the, um, the study that uh, Pew and Systemic published that they say, they studied and they claim that 80% of the solution is it's already there, the technology is already there. So it's our job, our understanding as Sukano, that is our job to bring this innovation to the market accessibly to address such um, diversity, yeah. Thank you, Alessandra. Yeah, that was a, that was a really um, stunning report, wasn't it? Some of the, um, yes. the findings, um, not only the opportunity to, to uh, to tackle this this problem but the uh quite scary increase in in plastic waste in the oceans that we're going to have if we don't uh make massive uh, changes so I, I would certainly recommend everyone check out that systemic and pew report uh breaking the plastic wave um i guess another issue here we have is when we're we're talking about the environmental impact of packaging waste um there's been so much justified emphasis on this uh, over the last couple of years that there's been a lot less discussion of other uh, sustainable um, sustainability impacts of, of packaging and packaged goods um, and certainly at Packaging Europe we've been trying to raise climate crisis and, and carbon footprint uh, on the the agenda of the, the packaging industry. Um, when we look at at um, pursuing these circular economy uh, targets and goals, um, I think it's very important that we think also holistically about the the, the, the broader impact of the changes we're making and uh, driving. Um, and obviously, LCAs have uh, potentially an important role to play in in informing this, and also in helping us to to choose the right circular economy strategies. Um, so once again, Alessandra, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your view of how helpful LCAs are at the moment. And, um, you know, we, we also have issues, don't we, that there's so many variables that inform the outcome of an LCA that it can be quite easy to manipulate uh, the information that we get out of it by, by uh, fiddling with the assumptions. Um, so where are we today with LCAs? How, how useful are they? And where do we need to get to so that we can have a kind of uh, harmonized benchmark? Um, Valentin already um, explained to us very well in the very beginning that the, the key to limit our environmental impact 
starts with the waste hierarchy that he described with the reduction, elimination of unnecessary packaging, reuse and recycling, the several ways of uh, recycling. Um, personally, Sukano, I'm in, I'm in my home turf because here everything is driven by uh, science. We try as much as possible to make our decision based on science-based facts or science-based uh, reports. Um, the LCA, the life cycle assessment is a fascinating world for um, science. Uh, from the science point of view itself, but also from the point that right now, uh, we see already, we saw already the first report or the first uh, cons public consultation that uh, the European Commission brought to our attention via the GRC group, so the Joint Research Center group, with their studies on the life cycle assessment of multiple material packaging. So they are also struggling and trying very hard. My understanding is, our understanding is that to guide us from a scientific point of view of what material in what application is provides a lower environmental impact over another material. However, I have to say that this is um, um, incumbent. Um, I, I, it's it's early in this uh, journey because the methodologies are being um, are being contested, or the methodology to calculate and uh, the the data that is being used on the different models that are being used, there are standards, so there are different standards for different models. Again, if we bring the topic of biodegradable plastic, which is a, a, a good or PET, recycled PET, again, I have to, to mention a, a report that Violia published uh, very recently with Imperial College from the UK, where they showed that uh, plastic in Recycling plastic brings, and I'm going to quote by my, by, by memory now, 70% lower um, carbon emissions than virgin plastic extraction. So um, the the PLAs have been also assessed with the life cycle within life cycle, and uh, whenever you count from uh, not from crop production, but because this is exactly the, the area of controversial or conflicting area. But if you count from manufacture until the benefit that uh, or, um, organic recycling, composting brings to divert food waste and prevent food waste, then they also show a very positive life cycle uh, results for the given intended uh, application again, quoting Valentin, as he said, for a specific heavily contaminated food waste of uh, food uh, packaging. So we are navigating into these new waters now. We pretty much support those uh, this direction because it should give a, a common sense, a scientific approach to the community, to the to the consumers, so that they can this this perception or this gut feeling that we have that plastic is not good will be substantiated and based on, on real statements and arguments that, that the science can back us up. Thank you, Alessandra. Uh, Valentin, I'd like to ask you also about this issue of, of, uh, of, of benchmarking and, and the role that can play. Uh, is that something that, that informs your work uh, considerably? Yes, of course. Of course, uh, I, I, maybe at first I would like to precise that uh, for me, LCA is not the ultimate tool that will tell the, the world uh, what is the best packaging. No, it won't work like that. Everyone is hoping that LCA will give this answer, but it, it's not possible. It won't be the answer given. Um, now, once uh, we said that, I think that you, you've said it several times, there is not one solution. There are many solutions, and depending on the country in which you are, it may not be the same one that will work for your packaging, for your market, for your products, and for your consumers. And I think uh, LCA uh, is a, a terrific tool to help you, to help as a company, to help you decide which is the best solution for you. Uh, and that's why we, we've developed uh, within CTO um, uh, an easy LCA tool, which is called B, B E E. Um, I believe it's in French, but maybe also in English. 
uh, on which you can actually uh, look at the impact on uh, on six different impacts, environmental impacts, but you can look at different packaging solutions to help you choose which one is the best in your specific situation. Uh, because I, I think that the, the the huge problem with LCA is, is more that the hypothesis and the data is, of course, the data that is entered into the tool is key to know what the, the best output. Um, and we do not uh, or we cannot uh, actually know all data for everything. So that's why it's uh, more uh, an accurate tool for a specific use for a specific company because there the data is at least we know uh, the, the perimeter, the exact perimeter of the data. Mm -hmm. Um, then I think regarding also LCA, we, we, we should remember that there isn't one environmental impact. There are several environmental impacts. Uh, we've talked about uh, CO2 emissions, of course. There is also resource depletion. Uh, there is, also, of course, the impact on biodiversity uh, of leakage of packaging, for example. So there are several impacts, and we need to understand uh, what solution has an impact on which and environmental uh, uh, criteria. Uh, and I think in that, uh, in, in considering that, that uh, LCA has a, a main issue, which would be on biodiversity. So the, the tool does not allow to take into consideration the, the full range of impact on biodiversity. And so it's very hard to, to then understand, oh, but if my CO2 emissions are indeed reduced, uh, what will be actually the impact on other uh, types of um, of, of criteria. Uh, but if you look at one impact, it can be also very interesting to, to, to first focus on, on the one that is strategic for you, for the company. What is my goal? Uh, do I want to reduce CO2 emissions? In that case, it's very interesting to focus on this one and look at the different solutions you have, you have identified, and you have tried to apply uh, on, uh, on your products to see which one is the best. Thank you, Valentin. So, um, so far we've been focusing on, on questions of, of design for recyclability and, and packaging specification. Of course, another link in this uh, circular economy chain is recycling itself and, and uh, sorting um, technologies and, and uh, collection. Um, so let's focus on some of these, these issues and, and dilemmas that, uh, that we encounter. Um, Roberto, first of all, I'd like to ask you um, about the the key barriers and gaps that that you would like to see addressed um, in improving the kind of end of life infrastructure and the coherence of these systems. Yeah, um, something that we already anticipated, uh, um, but for us, um, uh, the big gaps that we needed to um, to overcome are referred to on the collection and quality of, uh, uh, of the input streams that we received. Uh, European Commission is going in this way, so now we will see the new uh, variation of the calculation of recycling rate that is not anymore based on the collected, but on the real recyc uh, re uh, recycled, recyclable uh, material. And also the European is stressing uh, on the real uh, make all the packaging recyclable. Of course, there is uh, some a lack of uh, definition of recyclability, but uh, I think as uh, we shared in PetCore, uh, the definition uh, that it is improved that recyclable is something that it could be collected, sorted, and uh, used in a recycled pl uh, plant. So um, what we need, I think, is to connect so not to over uh, the gap, but connect in a real table, uh, a real round uh, eco, uh, eco packaging, packaging, eco-friendly packaging, collection and uh, recycling. So just to join the world uh, uh, marketing, world shell life, but also to put together even the world recyclable when we think something, uh, uh, when we project a new packaging uh, to put on the market. Thank you, Roberto. And um, I mean, a lot of us are aware of some promising areas of innovation. Um, so, for example, the Sustainability Awards, which which we organized uh, last year, was won by the uh, Holy Grail uh, project, um, which is something I personally find hugely exciting. Um, are there any particular areas of uh, innovation that, that you think are going to make a 
considerable contribution to improving this um, or uh, and, and do you think innovation is the the key area where we we uh, are looking for uh, advances in uh, collection sorting yeah I think that then uh, Valentino can answer it better than me but from our perspective uh, there are a lot of stuff that technically are already possible so just we need to push on the button and start to collect and sort as well so yeah. we can do uh, I'm thinking that we are already working on this topic, even with, uh, with CTO on this topic. On uh, I'm thinking of, for example, OPAC PT streams. We are working well on this topic. We can improve. But um, uh, Holy Grace, of course, it is a, a very great experience that uh, we are not. We are quite curious to uh, see the approach on the on industrial market. But at the same time, the big providers of uh, technical optical detectors are working to develop new technologies. Now we, we know that it is possible in our plant to separate and identify mono and multi-material trays. So it is another hot topic for us, start to recycle trays because up to now it's not recyclable. So, uh, or better, is skipped as not recyclable because technically is recyclable. And, um, or uh, we can identify uh, the, uh, the shape uh, of, uh, of the bottle, so going to the direction of food, non-food uh, bottle, which will be another hot topic for us, because uh, when uh, this new uh, legislation that are obliged, forced to put 25% of recycled PT in PT bottles, we need a gross demand of uh, input, uh, according to EFSA reg regulation, of uh, food container, uh, PT bottle to recycle. So. Up to now, this topic is, uh, a, is a, a topic only of the recycle that we need to certify the, the correct percentage input. Uh, this technology, I think that we can help us to uh, better certify this uh, process and think that also it is a, um, something to communicate to the external that we can uh, very we can build a very certified and uh, uh, guarantee uh, efficiently and sure um, secure uh, safe uh, chain because uh, this quite uh, a first uh, question is uh, my, really we can uh, recycle a bottle and put uh, to to put for another bottle B uh, people are quite uh, afraid that it is not possible so we need to also to work on this topic Thank you, Roberto. Valentin, would you like to uh, expand on, on what uh, Roberto was saying? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, maybe to, to, to the key barriers, uh, I think we, we're still in the, in the process now of identifying all the solutions that exist. So it, we are really, it's a very hot topic, as of course you, everybody knows, uh, and we need to, uh, to see what's possible, what's feasible as well, so to, to try and test. So I think currently what's we, we need absolutely to, to do right now is to try to develop. So we said collection, of course, it's key. Uh, we, we know that we need to increase collection rate. We have for bottles now the, the objective of uh, reaching 90% uh, collection rate uh, by 2029. Uh, of course, we need to develop the ways to do that. Um, then we have also to, to look at reuse. Can we develop reuse? Can we develop the infrastructures locally to develop in specific cases when it makes sense uh, the reuse of uh, some types of packaging, yes, we have to work on that. Uh, we have to develop recycling and sorting technologies, that is for sure, and I think we, we, we'll, we'll talk about it uh, a little bit later again. Um, and once uh, all the solutions are at hand, now the, the, the difficulty will be how do we actually help companies, so how do we um, uh, bring uh, all those solutions to the market? So that they become a reality. And then we will need, of, of course, a lot of uh, investment, um, but also guidance. Which one is the best solution? So among all the solutions that we've talked about and that are identified, we have to understand for every product, every consumption model, every distribution model, try to understand which one is the best solution for every company, for each company, and then help every company to go in that direction. Um, while also, and I think it's something we, we have to keep in mind also as a, a FMTG company, it would be also to, to keep challenging our needs regarding packaging. Do we need all the functionality that our packaging brings today? 
I think it's also key to be able to, to transform uh, the system and, uh, and, and go to, to the action of, of changing things as much as possible. Um, and, and to come back to the, the, the technologies, uh, of course, we need some improvements. Uh, sorting is, uh, is, of course, key. Uh, recycling and chemical recycling will be also some uh, uh, of help to, uh, once again, uh, try to find the solutions for everything, basically. We need to... Um, to identify really all the, 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 the best options for every type of, once again, uh, product, uh, consumption, and so on. It's impossible that in 10 years we still have some leakage in nature and, and, and we couldn't find a solution for that. Thank you, Valentin. Well, um, you, you just mentioned chemical recycling. That was one of the things that I wanted to, to bring up in, in this uh, discussion. Um, chemical or feedstock recycling, as it's also called, um, is something that's been increasingly talked about, and it's obviously still very, very marginal. Um, would, uh, would Roberto like to uh, comment on, on uh, the role that we expect chemical recycling to, to play um, as the uh, technologies mature and uh, are scaled up? Well, chemical recycling is coming uh, well and more and more a very interesting topic that we see as a re uh, mechanical recycling in a very interesting way because I think that uh, it is, I think that mm, we need to express and uh, repeat uh, mm, mechanical and chemical will never be fighting uh, each other, but we are the same part of the solution. So the, uh, I think that this is the big part I think that we need to support. So um, what we cannot do with mechanical, chemical can help to, in, um, uh, can help to uh, recycle, but uh, um, otherwise it's, um, it's quite difficult to see a uh, co uh, overlapping of the two areas because we, in this way we, we create a problem, not a solution. So chemical recycling, I think it could be a very interesting solution for all the packaging that are Realistically, uh, not uh, um, recyclable in a standard uh, in a standard way, mm, multi or multi material or other something like uh, something like that. But at the same uh, at the same time, also there are uh, other interesting solutions, the feedstock or uh, soft depolymerization. So um, these are very interested and R&D topic. Uh, a lot of people are working or team and working on this. So we are supporting this approach. Uh, seeing that uh, mm, uh, the, the mechanical recycling in milling, washing bottles can uh, gi give uh, this par uh, its part in, on this uh, scenario even. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we, we've talked a lot about technology just now uh, in, in terms of end of life. Um, there's also a, a whole area of trying to design the best systems for uh, collection and uh, delivering uh, quality uh, recyclers. Um, Alessandra, I'd like to ask you um, about this. Um, so I guess one of the dilemmas that we face is uh, a question of closed loop versus open loop systems. Um, obviously, closed loop is known for delivering better purity of feedstock, which can then you know, create a much more valuable uh, PCR. Um, on the other hand, um, it can have a, a negative impact on uh, the viability of uh, curbside uh, recycled uh, materials by taking out value, uh, valuable materials. Um, do you have a view on when and why we should use uh, one system over another? Yeah, Tim, I would like to comment a little bit as well on the gaps of, that we see on the recycling. Um, because this also plays a role on the, on the all aspects that come forward. So we, we heard very well from Valentine and from Roberto about uh, the, um, the dispose and the collection, the collection rate must increase, but it's not only about collect everything, it's the quality of the collection, because the quality of the incoming material will define the quality or the yields of the outcome material. As Roberto already highlighted, the European Commission will uh, change the way they calculate the recycling rates by the yields and not about how much we collect. So the quality of the collection is 
um, automate a, a, in, very important because when it comes to sorting, sorting is the critical part of recycling in terms of cost driven. It allows you to have high quality incoming raw material and then a high yield or not. And I think as a master batch supplier, we play a significant role on that because our master batch formulations will enable or disable or facilitate or make it more difficult to sort the materials. Um, also, um, we, have, uh, we have a lot of discussions about different sorting technologies, but today what is implemented are near NIR detectors. And the near infrared detectors are transparent, uh, are not um, carbon black as one of the colorants that we typically use in the plastic industry, not only to make black, but to make almost any color that you see in the plastic industry. So we took this responsibility and we eliminated non NIR detectable colorants from our portfolio. So our brand owners can still have their brand ID, their iconic colors in the market. However, we will formulate responsibly in a way that NIR detectors will identify those materials. We also see that the current technology of sorting uh, can separate different types of plastics with different uh, sorts of um, accuracy, but it's still feasible. We also saw that um, shrink sleeve that was or is of concern can be addressed with consumer education via policymakers, governments, and brand owners or any or retailers that are in the B2C type of business. And B labelers are the separation of the shrink sleeves before you dispose or while you dispose can also be uh, very beneficial for the second step or for the sorting stage. So I think there and, is- And eco-design as well. Sorry, Alessandra, but eco-design also is a way of, uh, of, of dealing with this issue. Uh, we are currently working on a project with a, um, what well, could be delayable during the collection process, typically. So exactly. the consumer well, doesn't have to do the, the, the right dress and so on. So yeah, it could be also- uh, off at the, at the, at the, exactly. for the recyclers to get, to get a more quality raw material. So we, as a master bed supplier, play a significant role. And uh, depending again on the geography, depending again on the infrastructure, we can also, um, support our brand owners strategy to go for closed loops. So we recently uh, developed and launched a report that uh, according to the, um, to the EPPP and the PRE, so European Pet Bottle Platform and um, the Plastic Recyclers Europe, these white monolayer PET bottle used as a light barrier for dairy and UHT milk can indeed be recycled back into milk applications up to 100%. So suppose that you have a scenario or a place where you can collect those materials in a closed loop system, you will be able to use those materials back in your, in your packaging. So again, talking about the gaps, I understand that uh, not only install the existing technology, but also, as Roberto highlighted, they are already investing on um, lines, recycling lines that enable trays, PET trays to be recycled because today we have bottle lines in the recycling of PET. And we have 1 million tons of PET trays ready, waiting for being collected and recycled. And this is, depending on, again, the geography, you have, uh, starting, you have this technology starting to pick up and I'm happy to see dentists uh, also addressing it. So then we have the question on the, on the sorting. Can you detect depending on the side of the tray that you get because you may get multi-material. Then again, I feel I have a direct role on it because we have developed um, some master batches that enable our uh, our converters, our designers, our suppliers to minimize the need of multi-layer or multi-material packaging.
by um, not having, for instance, um, incompatible materials that whenever the, 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 the sorting system you use will be detect or not your materials. So beyond colors, NIR colors, beyond uh, uh, different type of materials, I feel that we play a role in closing the gaps of the limitations that we have in the market. But again, the technology is there and we have to in enforce. I believe that if there will need to be a kind of enforcement level for us to um, adopt. But back to the chemical recycling and I as a pet supplier or a polyester manufacturer or, or polyester industry player, I like to call monomer recycling because in PET, we do bring the PET back to monomer to, the, to, to make again a PET polymer out of the monomers. But be aware, and, and Roberto clearly said, um, chemical recycling come just as good as the sorting and the mechanical recycling will be because they will not do any magic. The quality and the diversity of the incoming material will define the quality and the yields that they will be able to um, output. There is a chemical reaction, so um, they need to know the composition of the raw materials. And that's definitely another complexity, complex area to go because this is IP related. So yeah, this is, but yeah. the beauty is that innovations are there and I believe uh, recycling as a, as, a con as a total concept, we need to consider and st start talking about innovation and not only technology, but also materials. When a new material comes into stream, it doesn't have a million tons available in a, in, a, in a consolidated geography. So how can we tackle that? How can we address that to enable us to keep improving? I think that- uh, Maybe just- well, I'm Sorry, Go ahead. Okay. Alessandra, preferably I agree with you. I think that everyone is part of solution. So everyone in the network, in a very close networking, we can be the part of solution. Brand owners, Support, uh, suppliers, uh, inf uh, technology uh, providers, so techno uh, uh, optical detector, sorting detector, uh, eco scheme organization to give uh, clear guidelines and uh, uh, recyclers to improve the technology to the capability of recycler well and better. But everything is part of a solution. Uh, the problem can be if one thinks that is just one part will be the solution. So put on the market new material without thinking which is the real end life of this, uh, which is the end life of, uh, of the packaging. How can manage it? Which is the, the space board? So if we can answer to this, I think that everyone can uh, do this part uh, and we can work in a very close circular economy, only in this way. And uh, if I may add a team to complete your question about uh, the closed loop or the open loops or how to address it, it is very important that today this is another limitation for the recycling industry or for us that want to promote for the recycling are the outlets. So we definitely welcome um, some level of enforcement recommendation and promotion of recycling content back into the product. Be that closed loop, be that a wider loop. It's not open, it's just wider loop. It yes. should always come back to the loop, but it doesn't need to be bottle to bottle only and always. The metal industry don't do that. Glass industry don't necessarily do that. Why are we limiting ourselves in the plastic industry to if there are building and construction areas where they can benefit from those materials? And if today they yes. don't have enough consumption, we just need to kick off. Tomorrow they will have. Yeah, I, I do believe as well, I, I agree with Alessandra, that uh, closed loop, open loop, anything is fine as long as it does replace the same raw material with the same functionality. And then it's fine. Because uh, we, we shouldn't have this dilemma or closed or open. Anyone is fine. Anything that's working and creating new recycling streams is great. And we can, we can work on that. But we have to keep the value of the raw material. I think that's key uh, to not do good downcycling, of course, uh, for example, we really need to, to, to keep this quality up. 
And maybe just, I, I would like to, to come back. You, you talked about uh, carbon black, SMA, and just for, uh, uh, so that you know, we, we have uh, published a list on the, the CTO website of uh, pigments that can replace carbon black and that will be detected in, uh, in sorting centers. We are in that list. Thanks. Ah, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we've just uh, spoken about uh, closed loop and open loop, and and Roberta was uh, mentioning the the role that you know the various stakeholders have to play in coming together yes. to uh, provide solutions. Um, I, I guess we have some retailers within our audience today. Um, do you think that uh, retailers could play a bigger role in facilitating? Uh, collecting uh, valuable materials and, and bringing them back into uh, the, the system. Uh, Valentin. Well, honestly, it's, it's, my, my answer will be pretty short and easy. It's what we said earlier. All solutions are welcome. So if, if it can help in uh, indeed increasing collection, uh, why not? But it's certainly not the only solution, but it's probably part of the solution. So I, I, I would say yes. Yeah. Great. I would like to comment, and maybe it's a kind of a provocative also comment at the end. The retailers, just like the brand owners, they are the face of the product and the, the first contact with the consumers. So I also believe that uh, by the time, if they can help increase uh, um, collection and quality, collect, uh, high quality of collection, I believe the retailers must play a role and they, I, I personally think they have a significant role to play on it. And we have seen that they have already, uh, they have already, there are reactions in place. So they have uh, their own packaging that they have some uh, design uh, conditions that uh, they recommend. Uh, they have, uh, they promote a reduced amount of uh, packaging when it's not uh, necessary and when it doesn't compromise the functionality of the product. But I would, the provocative portion is that each retailer is again doing its own rule. So it's another source of additional complexity that we have to address. And what we see not necessarily are the same criteria or the same basic principles applied according to different retailers. And it's not about a geography and an infrastructure that is available. We see it's about material and some level of data that is considered or not. So that's my provocative uh, comment in here. We would appreciate if there would be a kind of a common sense and scientific base driven for those initiatives. And we definitely welcome all of them. Yeah. Thank you, Alessandra. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid we're... we're very close to being out of time now. It's been a really uh, a great, uh, <laughs> a great discussion today. Um, we've we've also had a lot of engagement um, with the discussion from uh, the chat on YouTube, and I'd like to. I'm afraid we can't answer all of the questions, but I'll pick out a couple, and um, we'll put um, the rest of the questions on our LinkedIn. Uh, page in case any of your panelists would like to engage with with them afterwards. But um, let's just go to, to one of these questions. Um, it's from Elmi van Hoof, who has asked, what are the current developments um, in um, creating one standard definition of recyclability and a standard sorting and recycling within Europe? So really, it's a question about harmonization, um, how, how far are we on that road to harmonization of, of standards for recycling and sorting? Um, Valentin, would you like to, yeah. to take that one? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's a, it's a very good question and one we, we very often have. Uh, unfortunately, I, I believe that right now, as long as the collection system, sorting, collection and recycling system are not the same in all the countries in the world or in Europe, uh, it would be very tough to have exactly the same recyclability guidelines for every packaging. However, of course, we are currently working at least on a, a, a common definition. So saying, okay, we can claim recyclable if, and of course we have to take into account, as Roberto said, a collection, existing collection. We have to take it into account the fact that uh, the packaging can be sorted. And we have to take into account the fact that it can be effectively recycled uh, at scale and in practice, as, as uh, the, the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation says. 
So it's, of course, it is key. I think we, we cannot use anymore the term uh, technically recyclable. It, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Uh, it has to be recyclable. It means that it, it will be recycled, actually, if it is well collected, sorted, and recycled. So we are currently working uh, within CTO in a, a definition with a lot of more precision, and that's what we have currently in the uh, in the norms, uh, the European norms, or even in, um, in other types of, uh, of text uh, that we can share, of course, with uh, everyone who is uh, interested. Thank you very much. Right, we'll take one more question. This is from Vincent Delessi d'Orvillis. Um, what is the environmental impact of chemical recycling versus mechanical recycling? Does, does anyone have any data about this? Uh, well, it is a quite new topic. So I think that uh, we, we talked uh, we talk before about the lack of homogeneity. So uh, this is an, uh, an open topic. So I think that uh, we needed to define a, a common standard how to calculate, which is the best model how to calculate the life cycle assessment. Uh, um, I think that uh, it's quite sure, and uh, Alessandra already confirmed that uh, the impact, the environment impact of recycling is, a, is a very important respect to the version PT. So uh, in this way, we can work, uh, this is the first answer. Uh, respect to mechanical uh, to chemical, it is, we are quite far to have some data because uh, today a very chemical recycling in the realistic way to intend this word, there are only very interesting projects uh, that are coming on the, on the, on the, on the top, on the, plan, uh, on the scenario, but not at an industrial uh, scale. So I, need, I think that we will need some uh, times more to have uh, some robust data on this topic, uh, on, my, on my side, I think. Thank you, Roberto. And I want to remind that uh, the chemical recycling most likely will come after the mechanical recycling. Yeah, it will be simple after. So there is also um, an area that we need to watch. It's not, not isolating them, but seeing the whole operation. At least yes. of course, some will materials be... will have a better destiny if they go through the whole recycling, including chemically, to be recovered, while some of them can already be recovered at mechanical. So it's difficult to compare, besides the fact that it's a very new technology and we don't have data at all. I am not, don't know if it's at all, but we don't. We are not yes. there yet. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. Well, I, I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Our panelists are looking, starting to look quite hungry. So I think we need to, to release them to have their lunch. Um, Thank you very much for, for joining us. If you've enjoyed this discussion, um, I would be delighted if you would subscribe to um, Packaging Europe via our website or to our YouTube channel. Um, in the autumn of this year, we're going to be bringing lots more expert discussions, um, including a virtual edition of the Sustainable Packaging Summit, which sadly we won't be able to hold as a live event in Lisbon uh, as we'd hoped to for obvious reasons. Um, thank you very much to our great panelists, Alessandra Funzia, Roberto Tangora, and Valentin Fornell. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you very much, Tim. And thank you, everyone. And thanks very much to the audience for uh, watching. Thank and you. Team, Goodbye. If you want to send us the and the questions, we can. I can. Uh, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Absolutely. We'll we'll put them on on our yeah. uh, on our LinkedIn and uh, tag everyone. And uh, yeah, there's some great questions that we didn't have time for. Great. Sure. Thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye.